evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you to uh, Brother Pastor Darnell. I don't I don't know what he like to be called. Um, but thank you to him. Thank you to all of you. Um, too bad we're not in person where I can see everybody's face up close. But you know what? That's okay. We are right. So do me a favor. Let me know how you are doing tonight. Drop in the chat and let me know on a scale from one to 10. 10 being I've never been better. One being I have a pulse, but that's about it. Like I, I'm alive, but I don't really know what, where I'm going from here. Let me know where we're at. Ethan says I'm at a 10. Love it. Love it. Who else? Eight. Solid eight. Not bad for a Tuesday night, seven and a half. I appreciate that, seven. Okay, eight and a half, not bad. Love it, okay. What does that normal mean? I know that, eight, eight, beautiful. So here's what we're gonna do. Tonight, I want it to, me, um, mine, oh, darn it, nine point, so difficult. Me, I feel like I'm at an eight tonight a solid eight not more not less uh, but you know what tonight what I wanted to walk us through was is the power of accountability and I know um, from my time at Kent State and my time um, being a part of impact that that's something that's valued by the organization and I just felt like this would be a good reminder um, a timely um just moments to pour into you guys about the importance of accountability, particularly in the environment that we are in. Um, I don't know about you guys, but this whole pandemic, my life is set up way different than I thought it ever would be. It is set up way different than um, I'm used to. And, you know, I would just be real with you guys. I think the amount of downtime that we have had and just trying to navigate a situation that we've never seen before, it opens up um, a lot of opportunities for us to get off the path that we know we should be on. It opens up a lot of opportunities for us to make decisions that we probably know we should make because we're trying to cope, we're trying to make it, we're trying to survive. And so I wonder if for the next few minutes, we can just kind of take a step back and really do an inventory. Um, mm, I'm gonna pray and then I'm gonna say something that is nowhere near on my notes, but I, I feel like, you know, maybe it's timely. Come on and pray with me. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your spirit. God, we thank you for your, um, your loving kindness, God. And I thank you for every, um, person, Lord, that's on this call right now, Lord, because you have um, birthed them into this world with purpose. You've birthed them with an assignment, God, and I pray that they will be diligent to carry it out. God, I pray in these next few moments, Lord, there will be no distractions, Lord. Um, I pray that you will confuse the plan of the enemy, Lord, God, to take what you want to do and um, where we would trample it under our feet. God, let us treasure your word in these next few moments, God, and I pray that um, I could just be a tool that you would use, Lord, um, and that I could hear from you clearly and speak only that which you tell me to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the thing. I was telling one of my friends earlier, uh, uh, well, let, let me step all the way back. If you don't know me, my name is Kelly Parker. I graduated from Kent State in 2005 with a degree in uh, public relations and a minor in marketing. Um, and I worked in corporate America for many years. Um, in marketing. And um, I then I stayed home for a while with my kids. We have three kids. I've been married for 15 years. So I was, uh, I graduated in May 2005. And we got married in August. And we have three kids. Um, my children are 13, 11, and eight. We have two girls and a boy in the middle. And um, something that my husband does to me all the time, and maybe I don't know if you have anybody in your life that does this to you, or maybe you do it to somebody but he'll be like, babe, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? And I'll be like, did this man think I sit up and study the weather channel? I'm, I'm sitting here with you, we in the house. I don't hardly go outside anymore. I don't know, I have no idea what the weather is doing now, let alone tomorrow. But he asked me like, I, I wanna answer right now, like tell me what is the weather gonna be? So then it's up to me, I gotta get online, I gotta do the research, all of the things to be able to give an answer. 
Like he wants to forecast. And I began to think about, but how much time do we take to investigate our spiritual forecast? Think about it. So the weatherman has these tools, like he has whatever software that he's using and he uses that to be able to see kind of in the future, like where we're headed weather wise. And I feel like in a similar way, God has given us his word. And he says, if you would sit down with my word and you would study it, you will be able to see whether you on track and where you are headed in your life. But a forecast doesn't mean anything if you don't take the information and then apply it. So if I hear the weatherman say it's going to rain, but I neglect my rain boots and my umbrella and I get caught in the rain and I get soaked, that's my fault. So from a spiritual aspect, if I look in the word and I say, now, hold on, where I'm headed in my life, the decisions that I'm making, the people that I'm hanging around, the, the moves that I'm making, I'm not on the right path and I don't bother to shift. I don't bother to make an adjustment and I suffer for it. That's my fault. So can I ask you, what is the spiritual forecast in your life? It's funny when there's like natural disasters and stuff in the world, like hurricanes and tornadoes. I don't know if you've seen this on, in the news when there's always, it always seems like there's that one family who like everybody else has evacuated and they've been given the directive to evacuate. But it's that one family that's like, nope. We're staying here. Uh-uh. It was bad like this last year and it's going to be fine. I'm going to stay here. And it's like, do you not see the signs that you're in trouble? And they're like, no, 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 no. I see the sun peeking through. We're going to be fine. We're going to be just fine. And so I want to ask you, are you ignoring the obvious signs in your life that maybe you are on the road to destruction? So when we begin to open up the conversation about accountability, uh, praise God for accountability because God has provided us with one another to help one another on this path of staying the quote unquote straight and narrow to adjust our life according to the forecast. So here's the thing. Maybe your mother did this to you because I know my mother did it to me. Matter of fact, I did it to my kids over the weekend and it was great. I loved it. But what my mother used to do to me on the weekend, she would have her day, you know, stacked with her errands, right, that she was going to run. And she would say, by the time I get back, you better have, you know, you better have vacuum. This kitchen better be clean, the bathrooms. And she would run down her expectations. And here was the thing about it. I didn't know exactly when she was going to come back, but I did know that she was going to come back. And when she did come back, she was going to want an answer. She was going to want an account for what I had done with my assignment. And so all I want to tell you is that God is kind of like my mother. Where, you know, the Lord has gone away for now, but he said, in the meantime, I have some things that I want you to do. And you don't know when I'm going to come back, but when I do come back, you better have that work done. And so it really invites the conversation to say, you know what, we are accountable to God. Why? Because he's going to want to report for what we've been doing in the meantime, that, that stretch of time between us being born and us seeing him, he's going to want to know, what did you do with the time that I gave you? Oh, yeah. So that's the, you know, flow with the imagery, y'all. You know, that's like the, um, you know, some of the work your, your parents might have you to do, you know, around the house. So we can go on from there. Thank you. Girl, I forgot I had the slides, but we're going to get it together. So the word of God says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. God is going to want an account. What's an account? It's like an answer. It's a report about your life. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to give a bad report. I don't want to have to give a report that I was sleeping on the job, that I was half hearted, that I knew the right thing, but I still didn't do it that I still wanted to do life on my terms, even though I knew better. I wanna be able to give a good report. And so it's really important that every day that you and I remember that we are on a mission. And it's, it's important because we're living in this crazy like pandemic time. And you might even be doubting, does my life even have purpose? Like what direction am I going in? Like what's even happening? I don't know what tomorrow brings, but let me remind you that you are born into this world with purpose and we don't have any time to waste. Uh, we got to be focused. We have to be serious. So 
one of the mechanisms that God has given us to be able to stay focused is to remember that we are accountable to him first. You're accountable to God first. And one of the ways that we demonstrate that we're serious about that is to choose to be accountable to other people. It's to choose to invite other people into our life to allow us to go to that next level. So if you think about the word of God, it talks about believers being a body. And really the imagery behind that, we're not, we're not ready for that quite yet. <laughs> Sorry. The imagery of, of believers being a body is that we don't function independent. We function interdependently. So if you want to get to your maximum potential in God, it is not going to be by yourself. It is going to be interdependent on other believers. And so I thought that, and now we can go to the next slide, that we will walk through what does it look like in the life of a believer to take accountability seriously? And so I want to give you my five seeds of accountability, and I'm going to go ahead on and ruin the surprise and tell you what they are right now so we all know where we're going, right? So the five seeds of accountability are as follows. Number one, commitment. Number two, camaraderie. Camaraderie is just a big word for friendship. And why didn't I just use friendship? Because friendship doesn't start with a C. So we're talking about camaraderie today. Number three, correction. Number four, confession. And finally, number five, compassion. So here's the thing, and we can go to, to the next page. Commitment. How many of you know that we gotta be personally committed to the idea that, my name is Kelly. Kelly Parker is accountable for the life that she lives before God. Like, I'm gonna give the account for me. My pastor is not gonna give the account for me. My best friend is not gonna give the account for me. My neighbor is not going to give the account for me. And here's what the scripture says, Hebrews 4, um, 13, it says, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So here's the deal. If you think you are hiding something from God, you're not. Like if you think that he doesn't know everything you think, every move that you make, everything about you, whether it be good or bad, he already does. And so really it's not profitable for you to hide something. It's not profitable for you to pretend that you're in a different place with God than you really are. It's not profitable for you. And so the first thing out of the gate is we have to be committed to the fact that we are accountable to God. And one way that we show that again is being accountable to other people and taking that seriously. Now, what does that look like? What is it like to be committed? What does it look like to be committed to being accountable to other people? Number one, it looks like honesty. So here's the deal. Maybe you have somebody in your life, I don't know, that um, would wanna hold you kind of accountable and kind of ask you some of the tough questions. That relationship and that opportunity is only gonna be as good as the level of honesty you're willing to have. How many of you know, sometimes we can conceal some things. Somebody might ask you, how's it going? And you might tell them part A, but ain't no way you gonna mention part B. But what good is it? How is that helping you? How is that profitable for you? Another aspect we want to think about is being humble. Humble enough to hear somebody out when maybe they're saying something you don't want to hear. Humble enough to understand that maybe all the time you and I don't get it right all the time. Sometimes we actually get it wrong. So when I'm talking about commitment, what I'm really talking about, I'm talking about this life that's committed to whatever God has for you, the best that God has for you by any means necessary. I'm talking about the mentality that says, I don't play games anymore. As the scripture says, if my, I'm quoting it wrong, but if my right eye caused me to sin or my right arm or whatever it is, whatever it is causing me a problem, I will pluck it out. I will pull it out. I, I will be radical with my faith because I understand that my father is going to want an account and playtime is over. So if you and I are going to take seriously that we're accountable to God, number one, we got to be committed. We got to be committed. So let's think about number two. I said that number two was camaraderie, right? Which is this is kind of weird word for friendship, for friendship. Now, why do I bring up camaraderie? Because when we're talking about accountability, how many of you know accountability occurs best in the context of relationship? Proverbs 27 and verse six says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So what the scripture is speaking to is 
faithful of the wound are the wounds of a friend. So like a friend might maybe wound you with the truth or, or say something that might kind of cut you to the core. However, you know, this person has your best interest in mind. You know, they want the best for you. So you can, you can take it. You can shoulder it a lot better when it's in the context of relationship. As a general principle, people can receive advice and criticism in context of relationship better than no relationship at all. And so one uh, observation that I have within the church is sometimes we take this so far about right and wrong that that's all we want to do. We just want to walk around and tell people you wrong, you wrong, you wrong. And we just think we're doing the Lord's work. You wrong. That's wrong. Quit doing that. But the Lord is relational and the Lord is gracious. And of course, the Lord is full of truth, right? We need to walk in truth. But what about building this context and this cushion of friendship and relationship so that we can receive well from one another? Um, a couple of years, well, I guess it was a lot of years ago now, but I, um, I was home with my kids for a while and then I ended up accepting a position to go back to work. And I saw this girl out, like, you know, the Christian, Christian woman like myself, right? And I saw her, I didn't really know her that well or whatever, but I saw her out and I was telling her, you know, I'm going to be going back to work. And she looked at me and she said something like, um, what well, did the, something like, did the Lord tell you that or something, something weird like that she said to me. And then she was like, well, I want to get your number because I want to talk more about this. Now, I'm immediately turned off for a couple of reasons. First of all, you, you don't, whatever I've decided for my household, you don't get to speak into that, right? This is not like, I'm not saying I'm going to go commit a crime, right? Whatever our direction is for our house, you don't get to speak into that. Number two, we don't have relationship for you to speak into that. You know what I mean? We don't have that context for you to be talking to me like that, Um so that, that was just a little bit weird. Like sometimes we want to go in and speak into somebody's life um, and we don't really have that sort of relationship with them. Um, something else that I thought about was a friend of mine, when she first came to the Lord, she was going to Bible study at a church and she was just going because she wanted the word. She was going in whatever clothes she had. At the time she had like tube tops and tight pants and whatever she had. And she talked about how some of the older women were really like looking down on her and being nasty. And it just speaks to, you know, you probably would get a different um, outcome had maybe you been more friendly, had maybe you tried to befriend somebody and then maybe show them a better way, you know? And so sometimes it's not always about the right and the wrong and you jumping in with what, what you got to say you know, would, would it be more profitable to build that relationship? And so accountability is, is not just black and white. It's about walking with one another. And so that's the idea behind this idea of camaraderie. So we're talking about the five C's of accountability. And we said we have to be committed, number one. And number two, think about the eyes of relationship and the eyes of camaraderie, number two. Number three, accountability has to do with correction. I don't think there's there's any way that we can have this discussion, not talk about correction when we talk about accountability, right? The scripture says, Proverbs 27 and verse 17, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. So let me see if I can if I can paint this, this imagery for you. So in order to sharpen a piece of iron, you'll actually need another piece of iron and you're gonna have to take both of those pieces and they're gonna have to clang against one another. And it's through this rub, it's through this action, it's through this, this hitting that both pieces are going to be much sharper than they ever would have been on their own. So it's through this rub, it's through this activity that they're going to become more effective and more sharp. It's through this rub. And so if I say it the, the opposite way, if we are not intentional about being a piece of iron that's going to be sharpened by another piece of iron, and be rubbed up against sometimes and corrected sometimes, we will not be sharp. We will be dull. We will have rough edges. Um, in, in other words, if you think that you're going to be this super Christian alone in your room with nobody else at any point in time, you're probably going to be dull. You're probably not going to function at the highest level that you've been 
created for you, are probably not going to be as effective as you could be. So let me ask you, are you, who is the person or do you have a person that you've given permission to correct you? Do you feel like you have that type of spirit where you could take some correction? Um, if we can go to the next slide. So in Galatians chapter two, um, you've got Paul speaking and you've got Peter. And really the, the scene is Paul is observing like, Peter, like you're not acting right. Like when the um, Jews come around, like you start acting funny and he didn't, he didn't like it. So Galatians chapter two, verse, starting with verse 11, it says, but when Cephas, Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul says, I opposed him to his face. In other words, I corrected him because he stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So basically, before the Jews arrived, like um, Peter was sitting with the Gentiles, like he was eating ribs, he was having a good time. <laughs> but when he saw the Jews come, like he wiped his mouth, he got it from the table, like he started acting different. And Paul was like, you're not right for that. Next slide. Uh, verse 13 says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So in their behavior, there was hypocrisy and starting with Peter and what Peter was doing, it affected other people. And the scripture says even Barnabas was led astray. Verse 14, next slide. And uh, Paul says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In other words, you ain't right. Like you switching it up, you doing all this stuff, and I don't, I don't think it's in step with the gospel. So I want you to observe a couple of things because, you know, Paul has some options. Like he could have talked about um peter behind his back he could have just been passive aggressive and just had an attitude for a while with peter you know he could he could have done a lot of things but the scripture says that i opposed him to his face i corrected him i did this with that iron it's that life on life it's that, mm, I don't, I don't, it's that thing right there. I'm, I don't think you're, you're walking in step with the gospel. It's that. And because of that, it caused Peter to come up to a higher level. So let me ask you this. How serious are you about coming up to a higher level in your faith? I can tell you that you will not get there apart from some degree of correction in your life. Why? Because we're all prone to error. We're all prone to mistake. We're all prone to drop the ball from time to time. And um, so when we talk about accountability, that, that's the beauty and the, and the gift of the body of Christ is that we, we invite other people in to help us and kind of course correct us along the way. So accountability has to do with commitment, has to do with camaraderie, friendship, correction. Number four, confession. Confession. Oh, it's getting heavy. Getting heavy. I, I want to ask you a question. When is the last time you confessed your sin to somebody? Like specifically, like, like a thing. Let me, while you think about that, let me read the scripture. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so the scripture is encouraging us to not only confess our sins, why? So we can get prayer. And it seems to indicate that this prayer has the power to overcome sin and unlock the power of healing. And so I wonder if sometimes we struggle as hard as we do because we don't want to pull somebody to the side and say, sis, this is what I'm dealing with. Can you pray for me? Brother so-and-so, this is where I'm at. Can you pray for me? Hello? Like, like maybe, maybe there's this higher level of freedom that's going to come from this boldness in confession. Like maybe there's some strongholds that are going to be broken because there's going to be some vulnerability in confession. And when we cultivate authentic 
you know, friendship like, oh, oh, I see it. Amen. I see. Come on now. Listen, I'm in my office by myself. So I don't know, you know, if this is resonating. So I'm just, I'm just rolling with it. So I appreciate your amen. But um, to go to the next level um, and to really be the person that God has called you to be, it might include, and I believe it should include as a, as a, a practice, a habitual practice to confess sin one to another. Are you the kind of person that somebody could confess their sin to? Right? Are we those sorts of people where somebody could come to you and lay it out there and you, and you will pray for them? Are you the type of person who has other people in your life that's so serious about giving this account to God and it being correct that you are willing to confess your sin one to another? So here's the thing. We know that we have an enemy. We know that we are not running this Christian race unopposed. And our enemy would love for you to stay isolated. Love for you to stay on your own so that he can distract you, so that he can confuse you, so, so that he can um, shame you. And we need one another to give us perspective and help us to stay on the right path. How many of you are like me? Sometimes you get discouraged. Sometimes you get confused. Sometimes you feel like giving up. Sometimes up seems like down. Sometimes left, left seems like right. And we need one another. The Bible says that we should be self-controlled and alert because we have an enemy that is he's prowling like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. And so some days you might have an off day. And you might need the body of Christ to surround you and be your spiritual eyes and be alert for you and protect you in prayer and protect you with encouragement. So if you're trying to do this thing by yourself, understand you're leaving yourself very, very vulnerable. Accountability has to do with confession. And finally, I want to end on our fifth C. So we said commitment camaraderie, which means friendship, we said, correction, confession, and finally, the fifth C is compassion. Compassion. So I'll be honest with you guys. I feel like the, the longer that I live, the more compassion I find because I realized the level that I thought I had my life together, I don't. The more life that I live, the more I understand my need for a savior. The more life that I live, I realize I'm drinking out of the same cup of grace than everybody else. The more life that I live, I realize my sins might be different, but they're not better or worse than the next person. And I'll tell you, I wish that I would have grasped this a little bit sooner in my life. I was thinking the other morning about, you know, when I was in school, I told you I was a part of Impact. And we had a, a young lady who was in our, our group. And I don't know if it was her senior year or, or I, can't, I can't remember, but she got pregnant. And um, Another girl in our group threw her a bridal, not a bridal shower, a baby shower. And I was thinking about this the other day. I did not go to the shower. I didn't get the girl a gift. I never acknowledged it, anything. And I was thinking like, Kelly, why didn't you, like, what was that? Why? And I think in my mind, I was like, you know, oh man, you know, I wish that wouldn't have happened but not thinking like, well, maybe she needs compassion right now. Maybe she needs somebody to support her right now. Um, instead of thinking like, you know, I got myself more together. Like, oh, I can't believe that happened. So the idea about accountability is understanding that the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Like we are all struggling. We are all figuring this situation out, everybody all of the people. So Matthew chapter seven, I'm going to read a few verses. Verse three says, 
why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So I'm going to go to the next verse in a second, but think about this for a minute. Why do you see the speck? So a speck would be teeny tiny. Why do you see the speck in somebody else's eye, but you don't notice the log, which is huge in your own eye? Next verse. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? Like you haven't even addressed this big, huge thing in your eye. You're like, here, brother, let me help you with your situation. Like I, I can't half see, but let me, let me deal with you and your speck. Next verse. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I like this, here's why. Because there's two directives here. Step one, take the log out of your own eye. Step one, be more concerned about the issue that you got going on. Understand that that's your first priority is for you to get yourself together. Understand you have your own issues, right? That was step one. Then step two, follow up with step two. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So it's not that we're going to, you know, excuse or turn a blind eye, you know, to sin in our life or anybody else's life, but we have to have that right perspective that says, wait a minute, I still have my own stuff going on. And matter of fact, that's much more urgent than whatever I feel like I need to do with you. And so I just want to tell you that um, have compassion one to another, like, who life can be complicated. Can I get an amen? Like things, things, things be happening. Okay. Um, so we need each other and we also need to know that no one is you're nobody is better. Nobody is better or worse. If you feel like somebody is, is better or worse than you, that's not true, right? We are all drinking out of the same cup of grace. And so as we hold one another accountable and as we seek to be held accountable, look for communities of compassion that understand that we are all striving. None of us have arrived. So here's the thing. And if we can go, go to the next slide. Actually, can you go to the one after this? I'm going to do this out of order. Let me just do this review. Then we're going to go back to that. So today we've been talking about, of course, accountability and how to be able to leverage our relationships with one another to really be able to give a good account, a good report to God. Five C's, commitment, camaraderie, correction, confession, compassion. Now, if you could take me back to, to the photo. So, you know, these are principles and they might look different in your life than they do in, in my life, but we need to be in community and seeking in an intentional way accountability that um, exudes or demonstrates all five of these characteristics. So, Here's the thing. I don't know exactly how this is going to play out in your life. But one thing I do know is that sometimes accountability comes from an unexpected place. So when I was about 12 years old, my mother put me in a summer camp. And one of the activities that we did in the summer camp was we had swim lessons. And every week we, we would go to this pool at this neighborhood school and we just love to have our little swim time. So it was split up. The class was instructional time and then you could just have fun playing in the water. And when we would have our play time, there would be the little rope like you see there, that red rope there. And that would split off the deep end from the shallow water. So this pool was the kind of pool that would gradually get deeper. It wasn't like four feet over here and 12 feet. It was like four feet, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, right? So you've got your red rope there that's going to protect you from being in the deep water. And we would stay on the shallow side. So it was my friend and it was me. And then I had two friends with me and we had kickboards and we couldn't really swim, but we were just playing and laughing and having a good time. So we were in the shallow part, in the safe part, but we were right against that rope and everything's fine. And we're kicking and laughing and giggling. And all of a sudden I lost track of my kickboard and I didn't have it anymore. So I was like, I had kind of went down to the bottom of the pool and I was like, okay, well, I just kind of jump up, you know, and get back kind of to the, uh, to the wall or whatever. So I go to the bottom and I realized that even though I'm in the, the part that was roped off as safe for me, that the water is over my head. 
And so I'm like, okay, well, let me just jump up, you know, jump up high enough to get above the water and kind of get out of here. So I jump up, but before I can move, I'm going back under. So then I jump up again. And before I can catch my breath, I'm going back under. So then I jump up again and I try to catch my breath, but before I can, I'm going back under. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation in life like that, where it feels like, man, I, I just can't catch a break. E e even in my life, every time I think I'm catching a break, I'm going back under before I can catch my breath, I'm going back under. And before I can catch my breath, I'm going back under. And the thing about that and being in that rhythm is that it's very tiring. And you might be in a situation right now where you are tired. You're tired of trying to catch your breath and before you can, you're going back under. Before I can catch my breath, I'm going back under. And so I'm doing this and up and down and up and down. And as I'm you know, trying to get myself together, I'm like, man, I hope that one of the lifeguards will, will come in the water because, and then I'm hearing my friends and they're yelling, she's drowning, she's drowning. And so I'm trying to, you know, keep up this charade. That's what it feels like going through the motions, going through the motions, expending all of this energy. And I remember I got to this moment where I was so tired. I thought I, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I cannot continue to do this anymore. And just at that moment, when I tell, when I, I'm talking about literally just at that moment, when I was just going to like, let go I felt an arm and the arm came right across like my neck and it was like this gentle like and just kind of led me right to the to the wall right to the shallow part and I thought to myself well thank god I, I'm glad that the lifeguard finally jumped up in here and earned your pay it's about time but when I turned around it was not a lifeguard it was my friend. She was tall for her age. And she was tall enough to come over there and grab me and save my life. Some of you are drowning today. Some of you are flailing. Some of you are trying to figure it out. And if you are drowning today and you are not accepting the help or the advice or the encouragement from somebody that can rescue you spiritually, from somebody that can facilitate your rescue, what are you doing? Do you know that your life is on the line? Like, like your spiritual well being is on the line. Some of us are so used to going to Bible study and doing all of the things and crossing the T's and dotting the I's that we can look at people drowning and say, mm, mm, mm. she should have did better than that. I wouldn't have did that. And to you, I say, what are you doing? Maybe it's for you to reach your arm out and save somebody's life. Maybe it's for you to encourage somebody. Maybe it's for you to lend a hand. Listen, I don't, I don't know how the Lord is going to apply this to your life, but I will tell you that we were created for community and that accountability is a gift and it is a powerful gift that will save your life. Woo! So with that, I am going to um, turn the program back over. I think I saw some questions in the comments. Um, but I will, I'm going to defer to your, your leading. Thank you so much, Ms. Kelly. When I say you that, that hit, it was just, it just hit different because I know this quarantine has definitely been just affecting us all completely um, in like different ways. Um, so I really appreciate you just speaking on that and touching on that because I feel like that just resonates with us. Um, so right now I just want to kind of give everybody just a second to kind of reflect um, before I dive into the question that's in the chat. So it's just going to be silent here for a second just to get some questions going and just for us to kind of marinate on everything you just talked about.
Okay, uh, so we actually have two questions here for you. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make myself the other spotlight video here. Oops. Never mind. All right, so I will ask you the two questions that we have here. So the first one says, um, for an alum who hasn't really, ooh, whoops, I lost it. For an alum who hasn't really found a new community post-college and is in a state of going to work and going home, who is also introverted, how would you suggest this person go about having accountability if they don't have a real community? And then the follow-up is when the only community they have are friends on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can definitely relate to that because I'm very introverted. Um, and I remember one of my years at, at Kent, um, kind of before I was really involved with Impact, I remember that feeling of feeling like the only, um, you know, the only one. And I would say, start where you are with what you have and begin to pray. Um, and so it might be somebody within your virtual community that you know right now. Um, it might be somebody that you kind of reach out, not with anything major, but just kind of light, you know, just begin to kind of, um, initiate a little bit, keeping it really light, um, but praying and asking the Lord, you know, who is that person? And I, I, I will say this too, um, it can look different in different seasons. Like I've had times where I'm like, I need an accountability partner and we're gonna meet on Tuesdays and talk about stuff. And sometimes you have that. And sometimes it looks a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't fit a mold. And so I would say, just begin to be open and. Um, I think the Lord is going to open your eyes to, to people that you have not really seen that are already kind of in your midst that you probably haven't seen in that way. Um, so I would just say, be encouraged, you know, you stay close to the Lord, um, you know, and trust him for that and trust him for that right, that right, you know, relationship. Okay. Um, the second question I have for you are, what are some practical ways to become a person others can confess to? Well, I think that people are always kind of testing us to see if we are that kind of person. So they will observe, how do you respond to other stuff, you know? And if it seems like you like really like are judgmental or, you know, how you take things, they'll be like, okay, she's not safe. I think that's one part. Um, just showing just how you react to stuff that you are a safe place. And I think the other thing is um, how vulnerable you are. And not everything is for everybody that you're going to spill, you know, all your business. I don't mean that. But like, do you ever, you know, just talk about a shortcoming or a struggle? I think that always helps people feel a little bit more comfortable with you because they're like, okay, okay, well, maybe she could relate. That's good, that's good. Um, so the last question I have here in the chat is, um, what would your advice be to someone who is struggling with letting other people hold them accountable because they're used to dealing with things on their own? Well, I would say if you keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna keep getting the same result, right? So I would start small, you know, with a little something and um see how it goes you know and it could just be communicating that to somebody you know it could just be saying i'm the kind of person i'm used to dealing with things on my own you know what i mean so this is going to be a stretch for me um yeah i would you know don't feel like this is this is a lifetime thing. It's not something you're gonna do overnight. Like you're just gonna walk out your house tomorrow and <laughs> you know, it, it takes time because we're talking about, you know, I think in accountability, I think it, within it, we're talking about cultivating relationship. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I would, I would start small. I would continue, you know, spending time with the Lord and stuff. And so I think he will show you that next opportunity, like that next thing where it could be a moment for you to share um, and be patient with yourself, you know? So you're not going to go from zero to 180 in a day. 
right? So it's going to be these one degree shifts every day, every day, every day. And over time, you're going to be like, whoa, I used to be the kind of person who would never say nothing. And now look at that. You know what I mean? So um, stay the course with it. That's what I would say. Okay. And then uh, I just got another question. Uh, when are you, when you were healing from the past trauma of abandonment and the thought of like confession scares you, what are the practical steps to reframe your mind? Um, the practical steps to reframe your mind. Read it again. So when you are healing from past trauma of abandonment and the thought of confession, like not just on the surface level scares you, mm -hmm. what are some practical steps on how to like kind of change your mind, change your perspective? Yeah, so the imagery that I'm getting is of picture yourself, mm, it's like, you maybe you've been picturing yourself i see i see somebody like falling and it's like you're picturing if i fall it's i'm like gonna fall on like glass and needles and all these things that are gonna hurt me but picture it in the way that the lord has set it up that yes you're falling but you are gonna fall into it's like it's almost like clouds or cotton or something soft like um the lord is inviting you to um fall into his arms and to fall into um hmm, it's like a comfort you've never really felt before um it's going to be like something new and something different but something that's going to comfort you in a in a way that's going to delight you and i think um i think that's it i think that's the reframing of um oh wow um i'm seeing like Oh, it's just a lot going on right now. But what I'm seeing is um, think about like a house being on fire or something. And then you come outside and you know how on TV, all, they always have blankets and they'll, you know, give the people that are hurting the blankets and think about, think about that. Like that is what we invite into our life when, you know, the Lord prompts us to confess or to share whatever. Um, and think about being welcomed by that blanket and welcomed by that comfort and welcomed by um, that reassurance. Um, and that's what God is inviting us into, um, that he's literally um, rewriting the script. Um, it's like, um, if it was an acting class, this would be like take two, like take one might've been you falling into all this, you know, drama and pain and hurt. And the Lord is like, take two, like run that back. And this time you're gonna fall into my arms. This time you're gonna fall into safety. This time, this time. Wow. Ooh, almost got me tearing up on that one. But that was a good one. <laughs> that was a good question and a good answer. Um, I had a question that I was thinking of. Um, so for, I know sometimes like we may think that we need like accountability, but like sometimes it's more so you just need someone to disciple you and like walk alongside you in that like role. Can you define kind of like what the two, the difference between like an accountability partner and a discipler? Um, it can be both, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's part of, how do I put it? I, I think especially when we're getting grounded in our faith, you want to have that mentor relationship if, if possible, you know. Um, and sometimes that mentor can be the one that holds you accountable. Sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes it's more of like a peer. So it can look, it can look a lot of different ways. And I think we can't be married to um, one thing like, oh, I don't have this and this and this and this. Like the principle is, you need to have somebody pouring into you who's teaching you the word, right? Um, you need to have peers around you that can kind of uh, iron sharpen you. Um, and then on the back end, you need to be discipling other people. You need to be pouring into them, right? So those are like the general principles. How it, how it looks might depend on the season of your life. Um, it might depend on a lot of different things. Um, so don't feel that you're lacking if it doesn't look one particular way, but you, within the ingredients of your life, there needs to be um, you need to be accountable to somebody and somebody needs to be teaching you the word, you know, um, I remember 
when I, I think I was like 19. Y'all, let me tell this story real quick. So I was, um, I was dating this guy and then we broke up, right? And then I got in my mind, girl, I don't know why, how or why that we were gonna get married. Now, listen to what I said. We're not even in relationship anymore, but I have in my mind, we're gonna get married. Not only that, that God told me we're gonna get married, right? And I am, I'm into it. I'm into my narrative. I don't know, I can't remember if I told the story before or not. But anyway, it took, I finally worked up enough courage to tell my, uh, like my mentor, like, you know, I feel like the Lord said da da da, da. And she looked at me and she was like, at first she was like, that's deep. And then she was like, you know, mm, like, is that, is that logical? Is that biblical? Like what, what you talking about? You know, so it's like in that moment, she mentored me, but she also was holding me to the word. You know what I'm saying? And so accountability could come from a lot of different places. Accountability could come from my kids. You know, it can, it can truly come from a lot of different places. So I think it's a matter of being open, um, you know, open to it and intentional about it. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes, that's good. That's okay. good. Um, so it doesn't look like I have any more questions right now. Well, um, well, you got one from me. Oh, all right. Hey, Dr. Parker. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, she ain't doctor yet, but she, you know, Kelly, appreciate you, Kelly. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, can, can you, um, I would like you to address that, uh, you know, that, that topic of uh, what, what, do I, what do I do if I feel that God told me that, mm. you know, I should be doing this or with this person or th at this time and uh, you know and it's really divorced from any biblical backing or anything like that you know so how do you how do you frame when someone says i heard god but it but but there's you know um but all reality is com is co coming against what they're saying they hear you yeah know I mean? yeah i think so so i, I mean particularly particularly uh, with in terms of like marriage relationship mm -hmm. dating or that good stuff i'm sure you've heard that before yeah you know? yeah so i think you know just in a blanket general principle like god is not going to contradict his word so he did not tell you to marry somebody else's husband he did not tell you to do you know so, so we can count those out but i think the trouble is see we can't, it's hard to discern the will of God when our emotions are highly charged. So when you want something really, 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 really bad, it's hard to hear the voice of God because you can, it becomes easy to like take anything, anything that happens and you'd be like, yep, that was God. See, that's God telling me what I thought he was telling me. And so that is when it is super critical to be able to have other people to speak into your life because they're coming from, from a more objective place. You're coming from your emotions. You're coming from, you know, it could be being caught up in a moment or, or whatever. Um, but when we're emotional, we're kind of vulnerable to a blind spot, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think in my life, this has been very valuable to have other people to speak into it and help me, you know, discern, you know, and then real and help you engage your common sense. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're so into our emotions, you need somebody to say, ma'am, he's not even with you anymore. Like, what? Like, let's, let's be real. You know, you need somebody to kind of help you. Um, you know, engage wisdom. Uh, one, one more thing, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. One more thing. All right, uh, I want to address, uh, uh, in your personal life, uh, can, can you talk about how the, the role of the local church impacted you in any kind of way or has it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or even post-graduation. Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, for me, the local church has really been the foundation of, um relationships of being um you know finding people that can you know pour into me and really having a a base you know what I mean having a um I think part of it is just the discipline of knowing you know at least once a week you know I'm focusing on being around people of God but even more than that 
having that be a place where I can find those relationships, where I can find solid teaching, um, where if I am struggling, I know where to go. You know, like I feel like I have a plan um, and some structure around my walk with, with the Lord. Okay. Um, thank you for all your answers. Uh, thank you just for coming here tonight to speak to us. Um, can I get some like thank yous or some claps in the chat or something like that for Miss Kelly? <laughs> um, 